A couple of summers ago, I went camping with two of my friends from high school, Daniel and Matt. We rented a small cottage next to a lake, deep in the bush. It bunked only four and had no running water indoors. Our drinking water came from a well into a natural aquifer about 15 meters from the cottage, and we had an outhouse 10 meters in the other direction. This place was in northern Ontario, very remote, with the nearest town being 30 kilometers away. We were all in university at the time, and none of us owned a car, so we had a rental jeep that got us there over what was mostly dirt and gravel roads. It wasn't the nicest day during the drive up, and upon arrival, a really vicious storm had blown in. It was impressive seeing the massive sheets of rain thrashing at the lake as we scrambled to get all our belongings from the trunk into the interior of the cottage. Lightning struck a spot on the side of the lake about a kilometer away. Even through the rain, I could see that there was a small wooden structure there that looked not unlike our own cottage. I remember making a mental note of it and wondered if it was another cottage and if anyone was staying there. We should check that place out tomorrow, Daniel called to me, having spotted me notice it too. We ran into the small wood cabin with the last of our food coolers and gathered by the window to watch the calamity unfold. It was the most intense lightning storm I had ever seen, and we even saw a tall pine tree capped by a ridiculously loud strike. That was all the impetus we needed to get away from the window. That night, I had a very bizarre dream that felt real, and in hindsight, I think it may actually have been. But in this dream, I awoke, and walked to the door of our cabin, and opened it. I didn't have any sense of purpose in doing so. It almost felt like it was a choice my body was making on its own, or like my cerebellum was receiving instructions from a higher order of being. In the dream, I stood in the doorway of the cottage and stared out into the lake. The night was clear, not like the mess of cloud and rain I fell asleep into. In the middle of the lake was a silhouette backlit by the moon. At first I thought it was a log floating there or stuck out of the water, but straining my eyes I realized it was the head of an animal, specifically a horse. My dream body wanted to investigate it further, but a different part of me was sure that I already knew what it was, that I was tired and that I should go back to sleep. As I turned around and head back to bed, Matt was standing right behind me, staring into the water with the same blank expression I'm sure I had. It's just a horse, let's go back to bed. I told him matter-of-factly. Then the dream ended, and I awoke to a beautiful morning light. At the time, I had no memory of the dream. In fact, it was two years before I was able to remember that dream, and remembering it is my inspiration for writing this now. Anyway, the day started great. We packed food and supplies in our big backpacks and set off towards the cabin across the lake. It was a difficult hike, as there was no path. We traced the water's edge and worked through a lot of muck to get there two hours after leaving. The structure was indeed a cabin, about the same size as ours, but it was missing a door. Unlike ours, however, it was built half over the water and even had a dock. Daniel took the liberty of exploring the inside, seeing as there was no door. I peeked in, but I didn't go rooting through as it looked like someone had been living there. Well, it's dusty. I don't think anyone's been in here for at least a week. Anything good in there? I joked, but with a very real intrigue towards looting. My morality may have been more flexible than I cared to admit. Yo, there's something here, Matt called on his way back from exploring the far side of the cabin. He was looking towards the base of the dock, and I came over and craned my neck over it. Oh my god, is that a guy? Matt began freaking out. Upon seeing what he was looking at, my heart sank. It really did appear to be a corpse, bumping gently against the posts of the dock in the slight waves. Dude, do you think that lightning hit him? Daniel now said, appearing behind us. I fought through my fear to lie flat on the dock, and dragged the fellow by the back of his flannel towards the shore. Matt pulled him out with a great deal of trepidation and flipped him over. The man's eyes had a milky glaze and he was extremely pale. He had clearly begun to decompose. I dropped my bag on the dock and got out the satellite phone and called for help. With the GPS we gave our exact coordinates and in five hours a helicopter had arrived. 
It was kind of a bummer to throw the whole day away, but obviously we can't just look the other way after finding a corpse. Mid-afternoon, a helicopter arrived, landing on the water, and EMS confirmed that he had been dead for about a week, and that most likely his cause of death was drowning. They warned us that even in these small lakes we shouldn't underestimate the undertow, and they warned us to be careful, and flew off. With most of the day wasted, we chose to head back to the cabin and shoot the breeze and just have an early boys' night, and the mood was more somber on the walk back. But as the sun was setting and Daniel got a bonfire going, our spirits began to lift. I got lawn chairs out of the jeep and set them up for everyone, and we started to laugh and bond under the moon. A sudden scraping noise caught us all by surprise as an unmanned canoe washed up on the rocky beach. Yo, that's bait AF, Matt said, and the three of us rose to our feet. Hello? Daniel shouted into the night. Did someone lose a canoe? I felt a deep sense of dread and instinctually looked behind me. I'm more anxious than my buddies in general, which Daniel was already proving, walking towards the canoe. I continued looking around furiously, backing away from the campfire to make it easier to see in the darkness. I took the Swiss army knife out of my pocket and held it upside down in my fist, trying to ready myself for anything. Matt was accompanying Daniel, egging him on as he climbed into the canoe. Yo, you don't even have a paddle! I shouted feebly, not wanting to seem like a buzzkill, but trying to discourage him from something that to me felt inexplicably off. Feeling isolated, I jogged up to stand with Matt as Daniel began drifting into the lake, wavering as he paddled with his hands. I lifeguarded with these guys for many years prior, so I knew they were both strong swimmers and I eased up a bit. Daniel was grinning and breathing excitedly as he got further into the lake and I was starting to envy him. It looked like fun. I dipped my toe in the water. Nope. Freezing cold. It was still pretty early in the summer, and we were pretty far north. Do you see that? Matt said behind me, in a dull voice. I turned and looked into his eyes and saw a quiet worry, following his gaze to the island just past the dock cottage. About a kilometer and a half away was the horse head I had seen in my dream. Although again... At the time, I didn't remember ever having seen it before. I pontificated upon what it might be, thinking it at first to be a bit of driftwood, then, logically, assuming it to be a person who had lost their canoe. It was moving at about the speed a decent swimmer would, but nothing you'd see at the Olympics. Daniel had turned around in the boat, a good fifty meters from the shore, and he was singing some loud soccer chant, had taken his shirt off, and was waving it around. Buddy's canoe! Behind you! I shouted to him, pointing. He turned around again, and I could see him tense up even from that far away. I felt a bit worried. There could have been an altercation if the guy thought that his canoe had been stolen. But Daniel was an affable guy, and I figured he would work it out. Yo, what th That thing! Daniel's extremely panicked voice caught both me and Matt by surprise as he rapidly began trying to paddle back to shore. We couldn't make out all of his words, but looking at the creature coming towards him, I realized it had a long head. Wait, is that a crocodile or an alligator or something? I asked Matt. There are no crocodiles in Canada, dumbass, he retorted. Well, what the hell is it? I don't know, I think it's a horse. Can horses swim? I don't know. Daniel had made it back to about 40 meters from shore, but the thing was closing on him quickly. Seeing it closer, I was beginning to agree that it was, in fact, a horse. You're doing good, buddy, keep it up! Matt tried to call out in support. Daniel wasn't even trying to talk now. He was focused intently on hand paddling. At about 35 meters from shore, the horse was about 10 meters behind him. Matt and I both realized that it would catch up to him, but we didn't know what that could mean, and we didn't want to discourage him. Then, the horse head sank beneath the water. I held my breath, wondering if it had given up. Part of me wanted to swim out to help him, but it wouldn't speed him up, and it was too dangerous. Ah! The canoe flipped abruptly and violently. It was clear that Daniel had not simply lost balance. Bubbles came up from the side of the upturned canoe. My heart was pounding. Matt had his shirt off and was running into the water. No, 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 no! Are you crazy? 
I screamed at him and lunged into the water to grab his arm. Matt looked terrified but said nothing to me, pushed me off of him, and continued wading into the water. But he stopped in another five seconds, each of which felt like an eternity. But I was starting to agree with him, and I waded in next to him, thinking that our combined efforts might be able to save Daniel after all. I stopped where he did, realizing that the water around the canoe was freakishly still. Where we stopped, the water was about at our navel. Matt dropped to try to look under the water, but I knew that there would be no way he could see anything. It felt like so much time had passed since we even saw bubbles. Then, while Matt was still submerged, the horse head reappeared on the side of the canoe closer to us. It was making eye contact with me. I pulled Matt up. We gotta go. He gasped when he saw it. We turned and fled the water as fast as we could. Nothing more needed to be said. We took one last look at the water from the beach. From the angle I saw it now, its eyes appeared to be glowing green, and it was where we had just been wading in the water, although it had moved there silently. We retreated indoors and continued to watch it through the window, both our hearts pounding, both breathing heavily, our own fear so intense that it was difficult to grieve Daniel. After half an hour or so, it slinked back under the water. I left my perch to make sure the door was locked. It was. You don't think it can leave the water, do you? Matt asked. I have no idea. I breathed while searching through my bag for the sat phone. I called for help for the second time in 12 hours. I explained to the dispatcher that a person had murdered our friend and we were trapped in our cabin. I knew the truth wouldn't help us. The dispatcher told me to make sure the door was locked and maybe have one person keep a watch on the window all night. He told us that unfortunately, they wouldn't be able to get another helicopter out until dawn. I gave him my coordinates and shut the curtains. Neither of us could sleep for the longest time. I found myself listening intently to anything I could hear outside the cabin, but there wasn't much to hear but the occasional owl or breeze. After a few hours, however, a scraping noise sounded from the beach. My eyes widened and I stared over at Matt, who stared back at me. We got up and cautiously moved towards the curtains and peeked out. The sound was caused by the canoe being dragged up on the stone beach. It appeared to be dragged by a man, although his back was turned to us and it was difficult to make out who it could be in the darkness. I felt my adrenaline spike as I wondered if it could really be Daniel and I checked the water for any signs of the horse head. I saw none. Daniel? Matt was taking things up a notch already and was unlocking the door. Wait, let him come to us. I tried to stop Matt, but he was already out the door. I took out my little knife and a can of bear spray and followed him jogging behind Matt as he ran to the beach. To my surprise, the man did in fact appear to be Daniel, albeit from behind. Matt came to rest with a cushion of five meters between him and Daniel, who had dropped the boat and was now standing still, still with his back to us. Daniel! What happened? Are you alright, buddy? Matt started to circle to get a look at his face still while keeping his distance. Daniel turned his head to look at Matt, revealing the same green glowing eyes that the water horse had had earlier. Matt! Run! I screamed as Daniel's body collapsed, completely limp on the rocks. Water splashed on my right, and I turned to see the green-eyed horse head rising out of the water. Matt was rushing over to try to help Daniel, but I couldn't look away from the water. The monster was 12 feet tall. It had a long, thin body that looked as though it was made from dead and rotten trees or their branches, and yet they became flesh-like near the head of the creature. It lurched towards Matt as if to grab him but it seemed very slow out of the water. Matt was already dragging Daniel's lifeless body, and I rushed in and slashed at the creature's wrist with my tiny knife. To our luck, the monster seemed to recoil momentarily. He's dead, just let him go! I screamed at Matt as the monster made a move towards me. I couldn't help them anymore and ran as fast as I could to the cabin. Noble Matt was still dragging the body when I looked around. If it controls his body, do you really want to bring it inside? I tried to reason with Matt, and at last he let go of Daniel and ran back to the cabin, sobbing. The monster reclaimed Daniel's body and dragged it across the rocks and back into the water. We got inside the cabin and locked the door, watching again from the window as the monster towered over the edge of the lake, then slowly slunk back down so that just its head was watching me back from the surface. 
Can we please just load up the jeep and go? I don't even think it can get out of the water, I asked, feeling stressed out. We can't just leave Daniel's body here, bro, Matt relayed through broken sobs. We have to stay and give our report to the police, Matt pleaded. I sighed and agreed. Again, I allowed the curtains to close and lay down, but sleep was just not happening for me. To my surprise, Matt seemed to be able to doze off. Maybe all the crying worked some of the stress out of his system, but I was still way too wired. What must have been another hour and a half passed with minimal sound from the outside, and Matt got up without making a sound. I didn't even notice him until he was halfway to the door. Do you need to go to the bathroom? We should go together, and I'll watch from outside, that would be the safest thing to do, I suggested, rising to my feet myself. Matt didn't respond or even turn to look at me. He made it all the way to the door and started fiddling with the lock. I bounded over to grab his hand. What are you doing? What's going on? I asked him, annoyed. He turned to look at me with the most blank stare behind his eyes. I had seen that expression before in my little brother in childhood. Matt was sleepwalking. Matt, you can't go out there. Go back to bed. I'm just gonna go for a little swim, he muttered nonchalantly. My blood went cold as he turned back towards the door and unlocked it. He started to open the door, and I slammed it shut and locked it again. He stopped moving for a couple seconds, as though he were trying to process what to do. Without averting his gaze at all, he made another move to the door to unlock it again. I knew it was risky to wake a sleepwalker, but I had no choice. I grabbed him by the shoulders and shook him violently. Matt! Wake up! You're dreaming, Matt! I screamed right in his face. His expression soured. He roared at me in a manner that sounded just like the horse monster had when I cut it, and he shoved me over the arm of the couch behind me, making another move for the lock on the door and swinging it open as I staggered. I came to my senses and tackled him as hard as I could into the wood wall. There was a hollow thud as his head hit it, and I was worried I had given him a concussion. But luckily, he was awake and began freaking out, asking me what was going on and reaching behind his head. There was a bit of blood. You were sleepwalking. I had to wake you up. What were you dreaming about? I asked him, horrified. I... I don't remember, he said, looking up at me, just as scared. He craned his neck to look out the open door, and I followed his gaze to see the green eyes of the horse at the edge of the lake, still staring intently back. It wasn't until then that I realized it had been the cause of Matt's sleepwalking. I shuddered and slammed the door and locked it once more. We both made sure to stay awake until morning from that point, and we got some ice on the back of Matt's head. When the police came, they did a search and were able to recover Daniel's body, floating by some cattails on the east side of the lake. The cause of death was determined to be simply drowning, and Matt and I got out of there that day. As I write this, after remembering what I had seen in my sleep on that first night in the cabin, I was probably sleepwalking too. Internet research has told me that this monster could have been a kelpie, a horse-like water spirit that lures people to drowning, but I have not been back to that lake, nor do I know why a kelpie would be there. On Daniel's body they found one other thing, a strange pattern of bruises around his ankle that they took to mean he got caught on something while struggling to get back to the surface. But Matt and I know that was the Kelpie's hand pulling him into the depths. Thanks for listening to the story, guys. Tune in next week for a brand new video, and come by Sunday night at 9pm Eastern Standard Time for Nightmare Theatre, an open book club for nightmares. You can also send your nightmares to me at theforgottengrove at gmail.com and I'd be happy to read them on air. And don't forget to hit the bell, like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. Until next time, embrace the beautiful dark.